though, I'm going to ask kind of the same question to the rest of you in the room. What does it mean to be a saint? And we can start with that Lutheran definition I gave the kids. A saint is anyone who is baptized. All humans are sinners, of course, but, and, but the baptized have been reborn children of God, right? In Lutheran theology, we talk about now, but not yet. We are saints now, but sin still clings to us. Fully sinner, fully saint. And that's a beautiful definition. It means that anyone wrapped in the promises of the cross has been given a new life, a new way of being, a new heart, a new identity. Almost everyone here can prance around a day and just say, I'm a saint, I'm a saint. It'd be a fun time. We'd just all get up and do that, yeah? But before you jump there, first of all, I want to say no. That doesn't imply anything about those who are not baptized. Just because the baptized are wrapped in God's promises doesn't mean God's promises are limited to the baptized, okay? So don't, don't go all high and mighty on other people. As a saint, we see the whole world through God's love. But other than saying, I'm a saint, what does it really mean to be a saint? I was listening to a preacher on TikTok, and they said, then they made an unusual metaphor to make a very pointed example. They said, you know, if you pick an orange, you can use it to make orange juice, right? It would be strange to pick an orange and make apple juice. Why isn't, why isn't it strange when you're around a Christian that you often seem to get everything but Christ? That should be strange. And it should be strange, isn't, shouldn't it? Because when I think about what it means to be a saint, I think about what it means to reflect Christ, to be a reflection of God's love to the world, right? Now, before you go there and start saying to yourself, oh, I do that. I love my neighbors. I help people in need. I'm a nice person. I reflect Christ. Let's pause and remember, we are fully sinners, right? If reflecting Christ was easy, we wouldn't need to be baptized to become saints. If living a godly life was easy, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and save us. If you think you've got this saint thing figured out already, you're, you're fooling yourself, okay? Martin Luther, patron sinner of the Lutheran church, never thought of himself as a saint because of how he lived. Yes, he tried to live that saintly life, that good, that happy, that loving, you know, thing. But the closer he got to that life, the more critical he became of himself and all of his shortfallings. The closer he got to that life, the more he thought of himself as a sinner. And the but it was only because of God's grace that he could ever think of himself as a saint. If you think you're good at reflecting Christ, you may need to do a double look in the mirror. So what does it really mean to be a saint? What does it mean to reflect Christ? Let's start with it means having enemies. Well, I know what you're thinking, Pastor. Back up. What did you just say? It means having enemies. Jesus wasn't your nice little neighbor next door who threw the best block parties and was loved by everyone. Jesus had enemies. I mean, do you think Jesus' friends nailed him to the cross out of love? Is that what happened? No. Jesus had enemies. Why? Because Jesus made noise. He made a lot of noise. When we're baptized, we have hopes of what 
baptized living looks like. They're written in our hymnal if you open it up. And the last hope on the list of what baptized living looks like is a hope that the baptized will work for justice and peace. Do you know what it means to work for justice and peace? One of the things means One of the things it definitely means is naming injustice, naming where things are wrong. What do we learn from anonymous groups? 50% of the battle is being willing to name that there's a problem in the first place, right? Working for justice and peace means standing on a particular side of the line, on the side of those being harmed and demanding that that harm stops. It means working to right the wrongs. It means making some noise. And when you take a side, you know what happens? There's going to be someone on the opposite side. The one who did the harm. The one who created the injustice. And they're going to stand against you. I mean, why did they do the harm in the first place? Let's ask that simple question. For any problem you can think of in the whole world, why are the people who created those problems doing that injustice? Okay? They're probably not doing it because they just simply get pleasure from harming others. People like that are rare, and it's a mental disorder, and we get those people treatment. Most people do harm because they benefit from it. They get something good for themselves out of it. Employers pay minimum wage, not because they want people to work in poverty. Don't think employers are all just evil or something. That's not what they're doing. But because as long as people are willing to work for peanuts, it's more profitable to pay them peanuts. Companies don't dump toxic waste in the water supply because they want to kill everyone. That is not their goal, okay? They are not intending to be evil to everyone else in the world. They do it because it's the cheapest way to dispose of harmful chemicals. Farmers are not tearing down the rainforest in South Africa and the jungles in Asia because they hate trees. That is not why they're doing it. They're doing it because they need money to feed their families, right? I never hit my brother because I thought in my head, I want I thought in my head, you know, I'd be just so much fun just to hit my brother right now. That's what I want to do. I just want to hit my brother. It'd be so much fun. I never did that. I thought to myself, I want to play the video game that he's been playing for an hour. I've been asking to play for an hour, and he won't give up, and he's not listening to me, so maybe if I hit him, he'll listen. I did it to try to benefit myself. No matter the harm, people do it because... It benefits themselves. And no one wants to give up things that benefit themselves, do they? They will fight, whether physically or through political maneuvering or whatever. One way or another, they're going to work to keep these things because it's good for them. And if anyone tries to take those benefits, if anyone says, you know what, what you're doing is wrong, they better be ready for a battle. When you stand on the side of justice and peace, you're taking an intentional position on the opposite side of those who are doing harm. And that makes enemies. So if you have no enemies, well, you might be a long way from where that baptismal journey is supposed to be taking us. I mean, I don't have that many enemies either, so I'm not there either. I should say, just because you have enemies is not a validation that you're walking the right direction, okay? You, 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 you can walk other directions and still get enemies. Just because my brother became my enemy in, the mom, in that moment when I hit him did not make me a Christian, okay? No, it made me in need of an ice pack to heal my blackened eye. That's what it made me. If you want to understand the Beatitudes Jesus just said to us today, You need to start here, which I think is a hard and odd place to start. But this is why Jesus says, Woe to you when all speak well of you, when everyone thinks you're great. For that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Because Jesus isn't calling us down a road of simply being nice. Jesus is calling us down the road of radical love. Radical love means going to where the world is broken, and being part of the healing. 
being part of sharing the kingdom that we regularly ask God to bring to earth. Radical love means not just healing, but taking sides and working to remove the forces that are causing the infliction in the first place. Radical love means not just caring for a person in a moment, but caring for the well-being of the rest of their lives. Now, I could go down the road of talking about how we be people of justice and peace, but that's a much longer road than I can cover in a sermon. So rather, I'd like to talk about a second thing it means to be a saint, because this is really important. Having enemies isn't enough, and we don't have enemies just to have enemies, right? We have enemies because we're working for good, and someone's staying against us. And if you go out just, and just create enemies, you're going to fall off the path really quick. So the second thing Jesus says to us after he says, you know, if all speak well to you, this is a problem. But if people start speaking bad of you, you need to remember something. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And no, before you go there as well, don't this doesn't mean living with injustice. We are people called to work for justice and peace. So there is no way loving enemies can mean accepting abuse or resigning yourself to being bullied every day. That's not it. What does it mean to love our enemies? And when I think about what it means to love our enemies there, I really think about Christ. After all, being a saint means reflecting Christ, right? Jesus grew up being taught that Samaritans were the enemies. But Jesus welcomed the woman, the Samaritan woman, even her own people had rejected. Jesus grew up being taught that the Roman occupiers were the enemies. The Jewish town, literally less than 10 miles down the road from where Jesus grew up, was massacred by the Romans, uh, 2,000 crosses on the road when he was a child. Surely the Romans are enemies. But when the Roman general asked Jesus for help, He went and healed the commander's daughter, right? Jesus grew up being taught that tax collectors were traitors, enemies to their own people. But when Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he said, I must stay at your house today. And what did that do to the crowd around him? They grumbled, right? (laughs) They didn't like it. Jesus grew, grew up being taught that sinners were the enemies of God. And when the woman was caught in adultery and being brought before him to be stoned, he knew the law told us what we are to do to the enemies of God, right? But he turned and had compassion on her instead. Jesus knew that Judas was his enemy, the one who would betray him. He announced it to the whole room. Hey, everyone, this is what's going to happen. And what do you think Jesus did with this enemy? Jesus gave Judas his body and his blood, the bread and the wine. Jesus offered Judas the grace and mercy of his entire life. And what about Peter, whom Jesus knew would deny him? And the others, who Jesus knew would abandon him? Do you think Jesus hated them because of their betrayals? No. Jesus turned and said, Tonight you have become my friends. Love one another as I love you. Or take Romans 5, where Paul clearly states that we, because we are sinners, are the enemies of God. What do you think God did to us, his enemies? Do you think he condemned us to hell? Is that what happened? You guys know the story, right? God proves his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely than now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. When I was growing up, I had no clue how to love my brother at those times when we were fighting. No idea at those times when we were approaching each other as if we were enemies. Life would have been a lot different, I think, if I had figured out how to love my enemy instead of throwing a fist. So I guess this brings me to my final point, which was kind of my first one. Remember 
that it's not about me somehow being amazing because loving your enemies is hard. It's not about me never failing. It's not about me making this world perfect. It's not about me saving the world. That's not my job. Being a saint means leaning on the promises God made to me. It means leaning into God's love, leaning into God's grace, leaning into God's forgiveness, especially on those days when I regret all the ways that I've failed. Being a saint isn't really about my actions. It's about God's actions. Because if it were all about me, and my brother and I had never stopped living together, I guarantee we'd still be fighting today, okay? But the promise of baptism is it's not about me. Rather, it's about the cross. It's about God's actions in Christ. It's about Jesus reconciling love. It, it's about how God didn't just resurrect Christ, but gave me new life as well. Being a saint doesn't mean being perfect. As I said about the beginning, it's about reflecting Christ to the world. Saints aren't better than anyone else. They're simply places where people can see the love of God. You are a reflection of God's image. You are a reflection of Christ. Take the moment just to believe that. You are a reflection of Christ, of God's love for the world. Let the image of God flourish within you. And then watch the kingdom of God flourish on earth. Amen.